I got kind of trapped into these subjects because I grew up believing that this book is true. It is my only source for truth. It is my compass in a sea of lies. Has there ever been an experiment done to prove that the Earth is revolving around the sun? Yes, there was uh, several experiments in the 1800s. Dominique Arego, uh, Armand Fuseau, uh, Augustin Fresnel. But one of the most famous was the Michelson Morley experiment in 1887. Tell it's us about that. Well, they used light beams to measure whether the Earth was moving. And they found that there was no movement. Was, the Earth has to be moving 30 kilometers per second to complete its annual revolution. And they found out that it wasn't moving by, in a very precise, Michelson could have calculated it to one hundredth of what he got in his experiment. That's how sensitive his instruments were. So the natural interpretation, and even Einstein admits this, Mach admits this, Born admits this, the natural interpretation is that the Earth isn't moving. So how do we get out of that? Well, you invent special relativity. And now you say, well, the reason that beam wasn't affected when it went toward the motion of the Earth was because the apparatus shortened. <laughs> huh? Yeah, Michelson's apparatus shortened as it was going with the Earth in its orbit around the wait, sun. No, wait, you're, you're telling me that the contraction of mass yes. was invented to explain away the results of the Michelson Morley yes. experiment. Yes, and that's what my book will tell you, and it's been admitted by all the scientists. Does, does anyone expressly admit that, hey, we had to come up with this contraction effect because otherwise we're stuck with a motionless Yes, earth. the very guy who invented it. Tell me what, Heinrich tell me what he admitted. Heinrich Lorenz says, I don't have any other explanation to this experiment of Michael Samorley unless I contract the apparatus. Otherwise, we're going to have to believe the Earth is standing still in space. If you put a long exposure camera at, pointing at the North Star, you'll see um, the stars will make perfect circles around perfect star trails. The only problem is the, um, the Earth is also orbiting the Sun at 67,000 miles an hour. Okay? The Sun is moving, dragging the Earth and all the, all the planets up that way or that way um, at 600,000 miles an hour. So why do we see perfect circles? You know, because that's the slowest speed, <laughs> that's um, uh, slowest motion in that in that mix, and and yet the, the Earth is moving 67 times faster that way, and 600 times faster that way. So you should see the stars do all sorts of strange mo um, motions, but you don't. You only see them make these perfect circles. That tells me that it's the stars that are moving, not the Earth. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. For millennia, well-educated people believed the Earth was flat and placed at the center of the universe enclosed there with a protective covering. In the early 16th century, Nikolai Copernicus introduced a different model of the universe in which the sun lay at the center and the Earth revolved around it. Copernicus' heliocentric model is taught today 
while the earlier geocentric model has been utterly rejected. If you knew nothing about science and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature, that's, that's what that is. And I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the um, revelation. During one of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. So it's even right that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. <laughs> Why do you think that uh, Truman has never come close to discovering the true nature of his world until now? We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented. It's as simple as that. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. I said, man, you guys, you, you lied about a lot, didn't you? And instantly he said, no, we didn't lie about certain things. We lied about everything. In 1986, the shuttle Challenger exploded about 74 seconds after takeoff, killing all seven astronauts inside. Or did it? It turns out that six of the seven are still alive and kicking today. Ellison Onizuka claims to be his identical twin brother, Claude. Yeah, I've got an identical twin brother, Claude, too. The Challenger pilot, Mickey Smith, hasn't even bothered changing his name. He's now Professor Michael J. Smith of University of Wisconsin. Now, Krista McAuliffe was a bit of a sneaky one. She was the Challenger payload specialist, quite famous for being a teacher. It turns out, during her astronaut days, she was using her middle name, Krista. And now she goes by her first name, Sharon and she's a Syracuse law professor. The Challenger commander, Francis Richard Scobie, is now Dick Scobie, which sounds like a rather unpleasant disease, the CEO of Cows in Trees Limited. Judith Resnick, the Challenger mission specialist, again, hasn't even bothered changing her name. She's a professor at Yale Law. And finally, Ronald McNair, 
another Challenger mission specialist, claims to be his identical twin brother, Carl McNair. What are the odds? Heliocentric means that the sun is the center of the universe, known universe, our solar system, and everything revolves around the sun. With a geocentric view, the sun and everything revolves around the earth, and the earth is fixed where it is. Now, here's the thing. My little, my little uh, excursion into this has revealed that most of the people that believe in a geocentric view of the earth also believe that the earth is flat. All right, I'm done with him. <laughs> Am I in a Sunday school class where the preacher believes that we have a flat earth? <laughs> no, I'm not saying I believe it. But I like debate, don't you? If what you believe is real and you really believe it and you have a foundation for that belief, you should be able to defend it. I have no respect for somebody who says, well, I believe this and that and you don't have anything to back it up. I'm not saying I believe in a flat earth. No. But there are some interesting points they make. the horizon always looks flat and I think most people would say well that's a perspective issue that would be the argument the typical argument but if you haven't seen it people should look at it that you're right about the idea that there's people who have attached cameras to balloons just independent people who've attached a high def camera to a balloon sent it up as high as they possibly could just to get that footage because it is interesting to do and you are right as far as as far high as it goes on any of these videos that I've seen, I'm a little surprised that you never see a curvature. Even thousands of feet up, you don't see that curvature. It's, uh, it's a little odd. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon it is not what they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That is why they wanted the interior dark and blocked out the sun from any other windows. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. This is a segment that they believed wasn't even being recorded, much less suitable for broadcast, for the lens was being zoomed out and the scene was being changed to that of an interior of the astronauts at work and apparently the stop button popped back up on the recorder without notice. Here is the diffused work light that they used to see camera controls, but not throw light onto the spacecraft's wall. Here they remove part of the crescent insert. Finally, the iris is opened up. See the real location of the camera and the very bright and near Earth out the window. Later that evening, they were said to be walking on the moon. How can this be when they were in Earth orbit only nine hours earlier? 
and the moon is some three days' journey away. Furthermore, if they genuinely went to the moon, why would they be faking any part of it? They were kind of laughing, but they were very, very, they were listening to him. He seemed to be like, kind of like this guy who was just this weird, I thought he was some sort of method. He's like, he's basically just like, taking apart everything that they know or that they say every day in the office. He was basically explaining the flat earth and how it works. And uh, he literally drew the UN flag. And I thought they, this is a joke on me. This is some sort of initiation to see if I'm stupid or to see if I'm gonna buy this. I, I thought they were fucking playing with me to see if I would, if they could convince me it was flat. And what was creepy about the whole thing is that they were more laughing at me for not getting it. It never went back to it being a ball with these gentlemen that night. It might have been that at the office the next day, in front of everybody else, you know, the underlings, but, uh, and then for weeks, I couldn't think, I, I, everywhere I went, like every time I saw a picture of the earth, it was like some, just a logo, it was a painting, it was like, it was a graphic. And then I started to scrutinize the actual images of the earth, they claim our photos. And it just started looking silly, like a cartoon, like why is the water so blue? If it's reflecting the blue atmosphere, but I could still mm -hmm. see the brownness of Africa. Like, wouldn't I be seeing Africa through the blue atmosphere? Like, why is the green and the brown of continents so clear with the blue of the water when the water of the oceans is just reflecting the blue atmosphere? And how come the whole thing, being three parts water, isn't reflecting the blackness of space? Like, it really, I started seeing all these flaws. And the more and more I tried to prove this guy wrong, or just to find out they were joking and pulling my leg, the more I realized. They weren't joking. And the tricky part here was the weather. So we actually had to take clouds out. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it was a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just hit Command-Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. What I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. But I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. The best way to brainwash the whole world, to lie to the whole world about what the world is, what is the earth under your feet? What is in the sky above your head? Uh, where did we come from? You know, it, it's now, this lie has now evolved into a big bang evolution, heliocentric spinning ball cosmology, when in reality, we're, we're not uh, a cosmic accidental sneeze, uh, nothingness turned everything. This is quite obviously intelligently designed, this, this thing we're experiencing here, this life, this universe. Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning, and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere, it's an it's oblate, and officially it's an oblate spheroid, that's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way, it's like pear-shaped. found this photo. Randmere State Park. This is from Joshua Nowicki. And what you're seeing here is a mirage. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage.
I know, Bird, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole, because it's getting crowded up there now, because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. That's a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, well, do you hope to see that? I do. This is the case if this flat earth is our universe then it elevates man and this earth to supreme importance where every life human or otherwise is significant and sacred and when we all realize that then the world the universe changes